Alicia and I'm Leah. Every Thursday we have prayer and worship from 5.30 to 6.30 at the station, no need to register and um, Cafe Salt will be open selling drinks and food. Glenridge is very generous and we love to give and thank you so much for giving. If you would like to give, there um, is the information on the screen for tithes and offerings. Over to Stan for the preach. Hello, Glenridge Church. Great to be with you again. Um, we continue this morning with our series on the Holy Table. And we look at another moment that Jesus has with a man that completely changes his, his life. And once again, we, there's some skills that we can learn from this. And really, I'm looking at all of these moments with Jesus around the table to see what skills we need to learn so that we can be effective around our tables and minister profoundly. Remember, we are the, are the premise of what we are saying is that Jesus spent a lot of time with people around tables and did so much ministry either in the marketplace and or around tables. And so much of, 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 of how he taught and, and how he challenged people was them was around food. Sometimes it was food out on a, on a, on a mountain or sometimes it was food on a table, but it was in these contexts of eating and and really, and really imparting who he was to them, but so much of it around the table. And we wanting to, as a church, get strong around the table. We wanting to say, Lord, we want to be a hospitable people because whatever the kingdom is, it's a, it's a, it, and whatever the kingdom says, it's a, it says welcome. Welcome, come to Jesus, come to the kingdom. This is not a kingdom that says, get out of here, you're not good enough. This is a, a kingdom this is a king that says, come to me, come to me. I, I welcome you. Come and eat with me. Come and eat with me. Don't bring anything with. Just come and eat and taste what is good. And so we, we're looking at this idea of eating around the table and, and really the reality of our tables becoming a holy table because of the presence of Jesus. And our tables becoming a holy table because of the way we work our tables, the skills we conduct, the ministry that happens there. We, we want to approach our table time, our, our moments around dinners, around our hospitality in our homes with, a, with an awareness of the presence of God and an awareness that God wants to use us in those moments with our friends, family, neighbors, and the nations of the world. So let's get into it. If you can go to Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And I'm going to read this to us, and then we'll jump into it. This is what it says in the ESV. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not. Because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, some translations say, when Jesus came to that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. For I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. They meaning those that were on looking, all the onlookers, lookers, the Pharisees, the, the other people, the party that was around him looked at him and they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We have a story of Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. He's, and, and to get to Jerusalem, he's got to pass through Jericho. And it's quite intriguing because up, this is chapter 19. If you go back into chapter 18 and look at the kind of stories that, 
that kind of Jesus teaches and the actions that Jesus performs up to the getting to chapter 19, it's actually quite profound. So in chapter 18, in verse 9, Jesus tells the story of a Pharisee and a tax collector going to worship. And the Pharisee um, kind of beats his chest and, and the Pharisee kind of looks at everybody else and says, man, I've done everything right. Who are you guys? I've got God. And the tax collector goes and beats his chest and he says, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And Jesus commends the tax collector, although his station in life is not very right with God, but because of his attitude, because of his humility, he commends the, stat- the, the, the tax collector as, as somebody that could receive God. In verse 15 of chapter 18, Jesus talks about the little children and and invites little children. He says, the kingdom of God, to to enter the kingdom of God, you've got to be like a child. In verse 18, Jesus tells the story of a rich young ruler that comes to him and is doing everything right. He says, according to the law, I've done everything. What must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says to him, there's one thing that you've got to do. Go and sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. The man turns around. And walks away from Jesus. He can't bring himself. His love for riches was more than his love for Jesus. And then in verse 35, there's the story of Jesus doing the impossible and and, and healing a blind beggar on the side of the road. And in fact, when Jesus talks about the impossible, all of all the way along, it's kind of it's, it's these things that are unlikely, these things that are impossible. Jesus is saying, no, it's it is a, it is possible. It's impossible that a tax collector can find favor with God. No, it's not. It is possible. It's impossible that children will find favor. No, no, it's like kingdom is found by children. Actually, the disciples ask Jesus when when Jesus says it's impossible for a rich man to come to the kingdom of God. They ask him, well, then how, whatever. He says, no, no, no. Actually, I am your preeminence. If you will come to me, it's possible to find the kingdom of God. And then, of course, in verse 35, he starts to talk about this blind, this blind beggar who the crowd says, stop talking, stop and keep quiet now. And he just persists, David, son of David, son of David. And Jesus comes to him and he says, what do you want? He says, restore my sight. And Jesus says, receive your sight and follow me. It's, this, it's, these, it's the stories that kind of preempt this incredible story with Zacchaeus. Um, what we know about Zacchaeus, and I, and I say that because what we have here with the story of, of, of Zacchaeus is Jesus doing the impossible. And I, I want to I wanna make sure that kind of, I want to encourage us. And one of my, my table skills we're going to have here is to expect Jesus to the impossible. For us to expect Jesus to, the, to do the impossible around our tables and around in our homes, is are, do we have a heart for Jesus to do the most unlikely things in our homes and around our tables with people's lives? So, Zacchaeus, let's get into this. Zacchaeus, what do we know about Zacchaeus? Well, we know Zacchaeus is, a, is not just a tax collector, he's a chief tax collector. So, it seems like kind of he's got tax collectors under him. So he's a boss. So this is, this is not, a, this is a, this is not a, 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 just a tax. He's a chief tax collector. This is somebody of stature. He is a rich man. He is profoundly wealthy. So not only is he taxing people, but he's probably getting a cut of all the tax that those that are under him is, is kind of a bit of a calm that's coming to him. And he's a very, very wealthy man. This man, Zacchaeus, is intrigued by Jesus. And it's interesting for me this, because I, I think, well, how, how does he, how is he intrigued? Has, has, how has he heard about Jesus? Well, well, maybe he's been there when, in chapter 18 when Jesus is telling these stories of a Pharisee and a tax collector. He's thinking, Chief, is a, a tax collector is not well liked. A tax collector is not seen as part of the people of God even. A tax collector is seen as an enemy of God. But yet, here's Jesus a rabbi is saying, this tax collector, because of his attitude, is more acceptable than this Pharisee who's kind of in the religious elite. Maybe he was there when he saw the little children, amazed by Jesus. Maybe, maybe the, this rich young ruler intrigued him. 
Maybe he was there when the blind man was healed. Uh, we don't know. We don't know why he was there. But somehow he's got some indication of Jesus and who he is. And, and that kind of Jesus likes tax collectors, which is very different to any other religious person. Never mind religious person. Never mind. Very different to any other person that he knows. Jesus actually has a heart for tax collectors. And perhaps, just maybe, he understood this concept of Jesus wanting to fellowship with tax collectors because Levi, or Matthew, was one of, the guy, one of his associates. And he saw how Levi came to be one of Jesus' closest followers and how Jesus brought him close to him, how Jesus invited him to follow him. So we don't know, but this man is intrigued by Jesus. We also know this about Zacchaeus, is that he loved money. He was rich and he loved money more than anything. In fact, he was able to sacrifice social acceptance for the gain of money. He loved money more than being accepted by his peers, by his friends, by his family, by his people as a tax collector. And he loved money and he would make himself an enemy of God for the sake of money. He loved money. Remember what Jesus said about a rich man. It's impossible for a rich man to come into the kingdom. He was also a small man. We know this about him. He was a small man. He was slight in stature. And uh, kind of in my mind, I can think this short guy, this small guy, Imagine how he was mocked and hated by other people and kind of made fun of and, and how he would put it in there, kind of turn the knife in there when he taxed them more. I'll get you back. Remember you used to tease me? Remember how, I can just imagine this guy's got kind of small man syndrome and he is going to make sure that everybody pays for what they've done to him. Not only because he's a tax collector, but kind of, Maybe he was small. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but perhaps. This was a man that was persona non grata. Persona non grata means unacceptable or unwelcome. This was a man that was unacceptable. He was unwelcome. And, and I, you could say this. This was a man without grace. Nobody gave him grace. Nobody extended grace to him. This was a man that was always unaccepted and unwelcome. Grace, the gracious welcome. The gracious acceptance, he never knew. He was persona non grata. We also know this lastly about Zacchaeus, is that he sought out Jesus intensely. He was intrigued, and this intrigue kind of moved towards a, a real sense of, I want to find, I want to know this Jesus. I need to see this Jesus. And he does something which is beneath the dignity of a grown, wealthy man. He runs and he climbs a tree like a boy so that he can get an elevation and see Jesus. For once in his life, he's thinking, I don't care what people think of me. I'm going to shake off this empty facade of wealth and, and stature that I've, that I've got. I'm actually, I, I actually, I want to see Jesus. This is a man who's intrigued by Jesus, but more than intrigued, he intensely seeks out Jesus and climbs a tree so that he can see him, knowing that he's going to pass by. And what happens is Jesus gets to a place, he looks up, and he says, Zacchaeus, hurry down, come down quickly, come down to me, I need to come to your house and eat with you. And it seems like Jesus goes and eats with Zacchaeus. It seems like there's more than just Zacchaeus. There potentially his whole household, potentially some of his friends. And he engages and he spends some time with Zacchaeus in his home around a table, talking, answering questions. Kind of, you can imagine him for the first time in his life, Zacchaeus feels like he's not an, unsi he's not an outsider. He's an insider with this rabbi. I've never, I've never experienced this in my life before. And he's just eating up what he can get hold of in Jesus. So I've got a number of table skills that we can learn from the story. Six in all. 
six table skills we can learn. The first one is this. Allow God to interrupt your plans. This is a key table skill. Whether this is, your, whether this is around your work table, your dining room table, your home group table, your church table, allow God to interrupt your plans. Jesus was going through to Jerusalem. Jesus was on a mission. Within 10 days, within less than two weeks, Jesus was going to be dead. And Jesus kind of, I think, was, kind of knew this was coming. The Passover was coming. And in Jerusalem, he would receive this, this incredible welcome by the city. They would, they would, it, it, it's, it's now called the triumphal entry. And this is coming, this kind of entry, this, this receiving, this laying down of palm trees and, and coming into the Jerusalem was coming. But before that, he allowed the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to interrupt him because it's, there's something like he got to the spot and he looked up. It's, like, it's almost like the Holy Spirit draws his attention to, to Zacchaeus as he's walking down the road. And he has the most profound entry into a man's heart, into the heart of one man, never mind a whole city. Allow God to interrupt you. One of the great table skills we can learn in our fast-paced life and our plans and our programs is allow God to interrupt us for the one man. We've got a whole city. We've got a whole world to die for. We've got a whole city that's going to receive us. But one man gets Jesus' attention and the entrance into his heart I want to say, potentially had a greater lasting effect than that entrance into Jerusalem. I think some of those people that were laying down, perhaps they were not following Jesus after he died. I don't know. But I know this, friends. We've got to allow God to interrupt us and take us from our plans so that we can see Zacchaeus. If we invite a group of people together in our homes, allow God to highlight one person. Don't just carry on with, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to just allow God, take the moment. Allow God to interrupt you and see what God does in your homes and in people's hearts. Table skill two. We've got to find and learn this ability, this gift. I don't know what it's called, this talent, this ability to release grace at a table. You know, you know what grace does? Grace not only accepts but grace creates an environment for change. You see, the grace of God embodied in this meal with Jesus liberates Zacchaeus from his enslaving greed. This, this moment, which, and you don't know the exchange of what happens. All you know is the people are grumbling and he stands up and he says, I'm actually going to restitute. I'm going to give back what, what I've taken. You, you see, a, a, an environment of grace, of genuine love, of genuine care, of grace, acceptance, and welcome, as, a, as opposed to persona non grata, creates an environment for lasting, profound change. You see, this invitation of Jesus to eat with him, in his house. By the way, he says, I'm coming to eat at your house. I think sometimes we've got to do that, friends. Not wait for people to invite us. Actually say, God, bro, I'm coming to eat. I'm bringing the food. Let's Give me a date. This invitation expressed God's grace. And God's grace transformed Zacchaeus' heart. You don't know what was said. I, I, I've got to think maybe... Maybe what was said was not as important as the presence of Jesus there. And maybe what, what is said around our, our tables is not as important as your presence there and your love offered there. You see, this meal enacts a missional heart of God. And this missional act, enactment, is there because of grace. This time around the table with Jesus changed his life forever. Friends, this is the grace of God. This is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit upon a man, a woman, a household, a family, a single person 
a, a, somebody that invites people around the table and opens their hand to the grace of God. It changes lives. God wants Zacchaeus's around our tables. Something there changed his heart. Something of what he already knew and something of the very presence of Jesus changed his heart to the point where he just gives away everything that he's got. In absolute contrast to the rich young ruler of 18 who walked away. The story is an incredible, you could preach this as a contrast between the rich young ruler of, of, eight, of Luke 18 and, and Zacchaeus of Luke 19. Table skill number two, we've got to release grace at our tables. Table skill number three, we've got to call people by their names. We've got to learn to call people by their names. Friends, you know how difficult it is to, to remember people's names. I find it incredibly difficult. And so often, I'm kind of with somebody and I know I've asked them their name once, maybe twice before. And I'm thinking, I can't ask their name again. What is their name? And the Holy Spirit reminds me. Like suddenly, oh, that's what it is. So we've got to depend on the Holy Spirit. Don't, let's not use an excuse. Ah, I'm, I'm useless at names. Friends, use associations to remember names. I remember what people do more than I remember what their, their names for some reason. And, and kind of I'm trying to ask God, Lord, I need to remember people's names. It's incredible. Jesus called them by name. Did Jesus know him? Maybe, maybe Jesus knew him because he was the chief tax collector. Maybe everybody knew who this guy was. He was recognizable by sight. Or maybe Jesus called him Zacchaeus because of his discernment, because of his, his walking with the Holy Spirit, told him what his name was. But you know what Zacchaeus means? Zacchaeus means pure or innocent. So when Jesus calls Zacchaeus, he doesn't call him chief tax collector, sinner. That's what everybody else calls him. Jesus says, pure and innocent one, come down to me. Friends, we've got to learn to call people by their name, to remember their name, but more than that, to find the gold in them and call them by that name. Lord, what, what is the gold? We can't see people from a worldly point of view, from a fleshly point of view. We've got to learn to call people by the name God has given them, by the destiny God has given them. I love Ephesians 4 verse 29 around this. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for, as for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. You see, Jesus, by calling his name, gave him grace. He recognized them as pure and innocent, as he was destined to be, not as how he was. And he says, and I want to come and meet with you. And around the table, Zacchaeus kind of has a revelation Actually, God sees me as pure and innocent. I don't have to be this guy that everybody hates. I don't have to be this one that's defrauding people and robbing people. I don't have to be this guy. God's called me by a different name. Friends, a table skill that we have to learn is to find people's names and call them by those names. And then Zacchaeus, it says, stood and said to the Lord, man, despite his stature, Despite his sin, he was able to stand because somebody knew his name and somebody called him by his name. Table skill number three is we've got to call people by their names. Their names of destiny, their actual names, but their names that God has for them. Call out the gold in them. That's number three. Number four. Table skill number four. Allow God to connect hearts and build relationship around the table. Allow your hearts to be connected. It's incredible what happens around the table. Friends, as we talk, as we laugh, as we pray, as we cry, as we remember, as we recite scripture, as we, whatever happens, as we talk about our kids, allow God to connect hearts around the table. You see, Jesus wanted to have a real relationship with Zacchaeus. He didn't want to just have an encounter in the street. He could have said, Zacchaeus, come down, laid his hands on him and, done something right there. But he says, no, I want, to, I, want to, I want to meet in your home. I want to see your family. I want to see where you live. I want to come into the place. Remember, tax collectors were with persona non grata, not allowed anywhere near a temple, get out of here. Never mind now you going into their house. Jesus says, no, no, no. I want to come. I want to build with you. Not at a coffee shop. 
Not at a restaurant. Are those things wrong? No. But man, we've got to get into each other's homes and let our hearts connect with each other around the table, spending time with each other, whatever that looks like for us. That's table skill number four. Allow God to connect our hearts and build relationships. It's not just a moment. Allow God, find those friendships that God opens up and invest into them. Table skill number five. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. This is what I started off with. Allow God to do the impossible with people around your table. You know, Jesus in that, in that text, he, he says this. He says, today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. I've, I never knew this. This is profoundly interesting. That word lost, according to one commentator, is a perfect active participle of the Greek word, which means to destroy. So I've come to seek and save what was destroyed. And here is used as a metaphor of permanent spiritual loss. So it's, it's not, this thing has been to, to seek and save what was destroyed permanently. It's impossible to restore it. Jesus has come to seek and save what was permanently destroyed outside of the grace of God. Friends, we've got to trust God to do the impossible around our table, to expect God to, to do the impossible around our tables. You see, Jesus, by just spending time with Jesus, knew that he had to repent and make restitution. We don't know what is said, but there's something there being in Jesus' presence, being, having the, the presence of the Holy Spirit with us, presence of Jesus with us, somehow moves in his heart that he knows he has to repent. He has to put right. He has to rethink how he lives his life and make restitution. First, he seeks Jesus. But in seeking Jesus, he seeks repentance. Friends, some, we've got to allow God to do the impossible. That wasn't, I, I don't know if Jesus Bible bashed him. I don't know if Jesus challenged him. I don't know what that is. Maybe he did. But I know the presence of Jesus made all the difference in his home. And Zacharias cheerfully offered to do as much as the law and more than what the law required in terms of making restitution. He does. And please can I say his restitution was proof of a, of a changed heart. His restitution was not what bought him his salvation. Just to put it out there. But God, the grace of God, the impossible happened that a rich man was able to enter the kingdom, enter a relationship with Jesus, and open, open his hands and make restitution. Zacchaeus became the evidence of God's impossible work by becoming a joyful giver. Friends, can we trust for God to do the impossible? Not just with our giving. I think God wants to do something with our giving. Because I believe there's a harvest there waiting for us as we give in this next season. But not just in our giving, but in every part of it. In the healing, in the talking, in the friendship, in outsiders becoming inside. Whatever the impossible is, God wants to do around our tables. That's number six. Expect God to do the impossible. Oh, sorry, that's number five. Expect God to do the impossible. And number six, lastly, Expect God to bring salvation to our house. Can we expect God to save a whole house? Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus says of Zacchaeus. Since he's also a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and save what was lost. Can we trust for God to, when we go and visit a home, to bring salvation to a whole household? I think we can. I think it happens more than once in the, in the scriptures. And Jesus demonstrates this profoundly. You see, Jesus came to save people precisely like Zacchaeus, the ones that are impossible to see saved. All it takes is for them to meet grace, to meet the person of Jesus through you, around your table, in your home, in your presence. Jesus was hated by his fellow Jews. 
they probably often said, oh, he's not even a real Jew. And Jesus says, no, he's a true son of Abraham because of his faith. You see, we can, we can expect God to do the impossible and put faith into people's hearts that those that are not even considered a real Israelite can become a true son of Abraham, more so than some of those Pharisees who say they are. Jesus wanted to know, let people know that Zacchaeus was a son of Abraham, both genetically and by faith, because he joyfully received Jesus. Friends, we've got to trust God to see salvations around our table, not just ones and twos, whole families. I'm praying for that. We've got to trust God to do the impossible around our table. Zacchaeus was lost to his parents. He was lost to the religious. He was lost to his community. He was lost to whatever friends he might have had, but yet he was not lost to Jesus. He was found by God. He was found by Jesus, extended the hand of fellowship and drawn closer. And it was almost like Jesus at that moment said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. It's my place to be on the tree. It's your place to be standing here looking at me and worshiping me. Let's exchange this place. Come and I want to come and eat with you. Friends, we've got to trust God for the impossible. We've got to entrust God to bring salvation to households. We've got to trust God to allow us to connect hearts and build relationships, to call people by their names and their destinies, to, to have the ability to release grace around a table and to allow God to interrupt our plans. These are some of the skills that I think we can learn from this encounter with Jesus and Zacchaeus around the table. I trust that blesses you. I trust that encourages you. And my prayer is that it activates us to allow people, to allow ourselves to invite people and to be invited by people to change lives around the table. Bless you and have a great day. Thanks, Dan. That was an amazing preach. Keep an eye on our social media for updates during the week. Bye. Have a happy Sunday.